the way out because we've added everything in the kitchen sink. And how many people on the call who are live now or who will listen later, how many of you have had the frustration that you've added in the fraud of conversion, you know, the fraud of the promissory note, all these different things that have gone on into whatever the matter is, only to discover that you've overstepped and your overstep is the thing that they use to throw the whole thing out. Right. And that's, that is the weakness of, of putting uh, too many issues in your defense or your attack. This is why it must be one dominating issue and then variations on that issue. Always one core argument. Now, of course, they can try and knock that on the head, but it actually turns out that if you present one, the strongest issue, the one that you know they can't get around, then that actually is the strongest defense or the strongest attack than throwing everything in the kitchen sink. You agree, Ron? I do. Have you had a chance to review my complaint yet? Uh, I'd started, but I, I, I will come back to you um, offline. Okay. But again, Ron, I, I'm very impressed with, with what you're doing. And I think this, this applies to everything we're doing in terms of remedy and everything we, we're having to do still for ourselves about thinking of the strongest possible argument, the strongest possible issue, and going with that and being prepared to defend that to the end and appeal when they do the wrong thing because that ultimately nails them. Yep. They can't use they can't use the game of logic of throwing something out when the argument when the issue is overwhelmingly solid and and uh, singular in its focus. So yeah, I just thought that was a very important point in what you're saying, Ron. Again, thank you, thank you for coming back and and answering those details. I might I might come back again. <laughs> I hope you do. <laughs> I hope you do. I mean, we can see. Um, I can't tell you for for yourself and for Greg. There's been a huge, and, and rightly so, there's a huge amount of appreciation and thanks. And really you're showing um, in the spirit of what we're trying to do, many hands, many thought. There's some great people, intelligent people that are coming onto these calls, listening to these calls, being part of these calls. We need more people to do the, the research and then help add for our own benefit and for each other. So good on you, Ron. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Um, there were a couple of questions here that I saw that uh, missed. Guest 38 asked this question, and it's this question. Do you think we should form our own hieroglyphic language for future uh, telepathic forms of communication? Well, that's a very good question. There actually are two languages that are still to be finished that I've been keen to launch. They are the purely hieroglyphic language of Eucadia for learning purposes and the translator engine to be able to do that and then a language that is a phonetic as well as a written language that is designed to communicate language as we do where I speak English or attain it and those two languages are still to be launched and given the time I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that it can still be done before the end of the year but those two languages are there to be uh, completed. So yes, that's a very important and a very relevant point. Uh, another question, just a quick one. Guest 37 asked the question, uh, what happened to the Divine Water Call? Uh, I, I did speak to um, Gino and I did speak to Brian, Brian Collins, who were hosting the, the Water Call. They've had constant frustrations in getting the call up and getting the call consistent and uh, given that there's been a number of challenges that they've been working with uh, they felt that it was um, unable to be continued which I know a number of you are frustrated because they're very good calls they are great information and both Brian and Gino have an enormous amount of knowledge to contribute but uh, I hope that they can come back and and let us know what the, the plan is, whether they're going to use a different platform uh, or whether they're going to go back to TalkShoe. So I hope that answers your question, um, Guest 37. 
let me have a look and see uh, other questions coming up here. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. I can't see any other questions at this point that are... Uh, okay, here we go. Question from Jazzy7. Step five, your judgment should be should it be strongly glued uh, to your original copy of your EDP. Is this correct? Um, the... I have to think from memory what our instruction is for step five. Uh, if it says that it's the EDP in step two, then I believe the answer is yes. Um, the answer is that the judgment becomes the public, the EDP remains the private side of the document. So the answer, I believe that question is yes. Sorry to be hesitating, but I'm having to think of that from memory. Um, Guest 38 asked another question here. Are there teachers for these hieroglyphic languages and do you believe they already exist in the universe? Uh, yes, I actually believe they do exist in the universe. Uh, are there teachers? I also think there are people who are naturally going to be teachers and are teachers and don't quite realise it yet. You know, one of the the... the mysteries of what we're saying is that we're not really learning in many things we do we're actually remembering we're not learning we're remembering so in a sense it's a paradox there are people who are already teachers that just don't know they are so sorry that comes across as a bit of a zen answer but i, I actually believe that that is the honest answer to your question there guest 38 guest 8 asked the question do you know the difference between Latin and High Latin? Can't seem to find this uh, online. Uh, there is a form of Latin used in uh, Mass that sometimes is is uh, considered a a higher form of Latin, an ecclesiastical form of Latin, and in that form, uh, it uh, reduces the uh, amount of words down to a few um, in some of the phrases so yes uh, as far as detail on the differences I, I have to say that I'm still very much a, a junior scholar of Latin and I can't give you a honest answer to that detail um, guest six asked the question could you elaborate a little bit more on the life of William Shakespeare? Uh, I can't believe he couldn't spell his own name and was he a Jesuit? Um, well, <clears throat> the thing about William Shakespeare and whether in fact it was Breakspear was the name. And there is some argument that the accurate name of the family is Breakspear, as in uh, Pope uh, Breakspear, and I think it was Pope from memory, and I please correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was Pope Martin the Fourth, who was the uh, only English pontiff, Breakspear. But uh, if I've got that one wrong, please uh, let me know. Uh, when we did a piece on William Shakespeare some years ago to explain that the Shakespeare plays and the answer to the mystery of who wrote Shakespeare, and just to put it in the context, when you actually add up the plays of Shakespeare, when you consider that the only possible way one man could have written those plays is if he never made a mistake because based on time and completion and word, it is technically impossible for one man to recite those plays in the time available unless he never, ever made a mistake and was writing something like uh, two pages a day perfectly, handwritten. 
that it was actually the College of, uh, College of English, which was one of the first colleges created in the Vatican. There's a college for English, German, and this is where the languages were uh, boiled up. But at the College of English, the greatest minds of England sought refuge because under Elizabeth, there was a purge of Catholics. And unfortunately for England, and fortunately for the Vatican, much of Oxford and other institutions were full of uh, people who still uh, followed Catholicism. So uh, they released a book, and it was the, uh, the record of those that had lodgings at the College of English. And the Jesuits themselves launched this and showed the signature of William Shakespeare under a nom de plume at the College of English. So either uh, he was illiterate or the word Shakespeare was deliberately corrupted um, later. And of course, what we're told is the history has all been slightly modified. So that's a bit of a long-winded answer. But, um, and of course, people talk about Shakespeare being Francis Bacon. It wasn't Francis Bacon. It was the Jesuit College of English. Um, and why? Because remember I said to you that every court case is a sacrament of penance and you want to understand the commercial transactions of how the modern court system of common law works. Common law introduced a very complex system. It introduced at one level the ecclesiastical, which is the completion of the self-confession. At another level, it was the completion of uh, bonds and making money. And at another level, it was the honouring of statutes. Uh, so it was a very, very complex system. And because of it being so complex, there was no prevailing history. There was no case law to go to. So look at Shakespeare, and what you see is you have an instruction for murder, an instruction for property theft, an instruction for contract law, an instruction for marriage, and all the major commercial transactions that the courts need to perfect in order to make money is embedded in Shakespeare. Well, who invented the commercialization of the commercialization of the law? It was the Catholic Church. Who do you think wrote Shakespeare? Um, okay, who else do we have questions? Uh, I see Ron is lit up again, so I'll get on to uh, Ron. I just want to see... Um, uh, Wuji just asked this question about channeling information. Um, I probably have to ask Wuji if you can give a bit more, a bit more of a question, a bit more detail. If you're asking, is Eucadia and what we're doing uh, channeled? My my concern always in saying that information is channeled is that it implies a certain savant nature. Uh, I believe that our divine self and our higher self, particularly our divine self, is connected to unique collective awareness, is connected to the source. So in a sense, when we have those rare moments where we are aligned, it's less about channeling, it's more about knowing and sensing so I, I prefer to, to use that as an analogy than to perpetuate the idea that we are merely mouthpieces uh, for some higher intelligence. But <clears throat> a lot of the stuff is sensing. A lot of you know, the research is sensing. You don't know what you don't know. Uh, you can't know what you don't know. So in many cases, it's sensing something. Um, and then from the sensing comes the knowing. So I hope that answers it a little bit for you, uh, Wuji, on that question. Uh, before I get to Ron, I'm just going to say, um, if I've missed a question uh, that you've asked, I'm sorry, um, please. Uh, always, I want to get through to all the questions that people ask. And if I missed something, again, I'm sorry if I've, I've missed it. So I'm going to take Ron's call here. 
and then I'm going to wrap up. So uh, here.